you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Daniel chapter 9. As we're continuing in this series on elements of true intercessory prayer. This is part three. And uh, I'll read the verses as we go along. Will you join me in prayer? He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. Amen. Well, we're looking at Daniel's prayer, and we're trying to learn from this man the elements of true intercession. And we've seen so far four elements of true intercessory prayer in this text. First, we saw that prayer is rooted in the Word of God. When we go to pray, we pray primarily as a response to His Word acting on our hearts. Uh, We see Daniel doing this. Look at verses 2 and 3. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books, so he's reading the word of God, the number of years which was revealed as the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So what's his response? Verse 3, so I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplications. You read the Word of God, it has an impact on your heart, and you pray. Secondly, we saw that prayer is grounded in the will of God. It's rooted in the Word of God, it's grounded in the will of God. Daniel's reading God's Word to Jeremiah, which tells him that after 70 years, Jerusalem is going to be restored. And so Daniel prays. And he says down in verse 19, Lord, do it. Do your will. Do what you said you would do. Look at verse 19. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and take action. For your own sake, O my God, do not delay because your city and your people are called by your name. And we talked about how that is essentially the heart of all true intercessory prayer. It's the lining up of our wills with His will, right? It's not badgering God. It's not going to God to try to get Him to convert over to our agenda uh, or to get goodies from God or whatever. It's lining our wills up with His. The third element we saw in our text is that true intercessory prayer is characterized by fervency, Look at verse 3. Daniel says, I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek Him by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Fasting, sackcloth, ashes accompanied Daniel's prayer for himself and his people. All the cultural indicators of humble, fervent dependence upon God. Daniel wrestled with God in prayer. True prayer is the setting of the heart towards something. It's not just a passing, fleeting thing like two ships passing by one another in the night. It's a setting of the heart. There's intentionality. There's purpose. Fourthly, we saw that prayer is realized in self-denial. It's realized in self-denial. Look at the first part of verse 4. Daniel says, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. The heart of all true prayer is an initial awareness that we don't even belong there to begin with. And before we can pray effectively for someone else, we have to get ourselves in the right perspective first. And we talked about how if there's impotence in our prayer lives, maybe it's because there's not much self-denial. 
going on. Maybe it's because there's not the setting aside of our wills for his will. We should always be seeking God for a deeper repentance in our lives, a horror over sin if we're going to pray effectively for other people. Well, today I want to look at a fifth and sixth element of intercessory prayer. Element number five, true intercessory prayer is identified with God's people. It's identified with God's people. Notice that Daniel says in verse four that he prayed to the Lord and made my confession. He starts with himself, but he doesn't stop there. Look at verse five. We have sinned. Verse six, we have not listened. Verse seven, to you belongs righteousness, but to us, open shame. Verse eight, open shame belongs to us. Verse 10, neither have we obeyed. Verse 11, all Israel has transgressed. The curse has been poured out on us. Verse 13, us, our, we. Verse 14, us, we. Verse 15, we. Verse 16, our sin. True intercessory prayer identifies the one praying with the people being prayed for. Paul knew that. He said, praying all the time for all the saints. And then he added, pray most of all for me. See, we take care of setting ourselves aside and then we focus our prayers on others. Daniel saw himself bound up with his people. 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 23 puts it this way. God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. So the focal point of prayer is often for others, right? I start with me, I get myself in the right perspective, and then I pray for others. And we're missing this, see, if our praying is consumed with I, me, mine, Words like that. We're not embracing the needs of God's people. Prayer is not only to be a private, personal exercise for us to get God's goodies. The focus of true intercessory prayer is praying for others and recruiting prayer from others for ourselves. Paul was always saying, I'm praying for you. But then he says, you also Pray for me. You know, it was a mutual thing. Daniel prayed for his people. And something else here. Notice he included himself in their sins. When you read through this prayer, when you read through this passage, he included himself in their shortcomings, in their failures and so forth. He encompassed himself in his prayers. And again, Paul did the same thing. Romans chapter 9, he says there that he prays diligently for the salvation of, of, of his people, that in their being saved, he could almost wish that he himself would lose his own salvation if it meant salvation for them. So what's the secret of intercession? Intercessory prayer, what is it? Well, It's that in our prayers, we don't say, me, me, me. But we say, we, we, we. We identify with God's people. The sixth principle we see here. True intercessory prayer is generated by the word of God. It's grounded in the will of God. It's characterized by fervency. It's realized in self-denial. It's identified with God's people. And sixthly, it's strengthened in confession. 
Intercessory prayer is strengthened in confession. Okay, we've already seen that Daniel had personally denied himself in expressing his confession. And if you look at verse 20, he says, While I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people. Daniel didn't just become a critic of the church and see himself as the only righteous one around, you know, as the only guy with his head on straight. He knew he was a sinner too. And when God is at work in a life, repentance and confession become a norm. They become a way of life. The more devout our soul is, the deeper our love for God the higher our standard of holiness, the truer our commitment to Christ, then the greater will be our sense of sinfulness. If we think that becoming a more mature Christian uh, means less and less sensitivity towards our sin, just the opposite is true. Just the opposite is true. The closer we get to God, the more heinous sin becomes. Uh, Tim Keller put it this way, the closer you get to superlative, the more flaws you're going to see. That was Paul's experience in Romans 7. When he really understood the law of God, when he really understood God's standard. It was then that Paul said, I saw myself and sin revived and I died. He says it slew me. It killed me. And this was part of Daniel's prayer life. The confession of his own sin and the sins of his people. In Jeremiah chapter 3 and then again in chapter 8 and then again in chapter 14 and in Lamentations chapter 1, which Jeremiah also wrote, in all four places Jeremiah cries out in confession to God as he senses the coming judgment. Intercession is strengthened in confession. I read a story, I was sharing it with Steve earlier, of a farmer who went with his son to a wheat field. He wanted to see if it was ready for the harvest. And his son said, see how straight the stems hold up their heads? The ones that hold up their heads so straight, they must be the best ones. Those that are bent over there and hanging down, they can't be good for much. And so the farmer plucked a stalk of each kind. And he said to his boy, look at this. The reason they stand so straight is because the grain is so small. There's no fruit on them. The bent ones are the good ones. The straight ones are well nigh useless. That's the way it is in the kingdom of God. It's those who are bent and broken who are useful because they confess. What would people say about you? What would they say about me? Are we tall, straight, proud? Or are we bent and broken? Look at verse 5. We have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly, and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. He says four things in that one verse. They had sinned. That means missed the mark. They had committed iniquity. That means to distort or act perversely. They had acted wickedly. There's premeditated evil. They had rebelled. 
to defy authority. He gives us four different Hebrew words here for sin, and they had committed all of them. They had departed from God's precepts. And when they departed, they didn't return. Look at verse 6. Moreover, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. They didn't listen to God's spokesman. They went their way without heeding his call. Look at verse 7. Righteousness belongs to you, O Lord, but to us open shame. Righteousness belongs to God, Daniel says, but to them, open shame. Look at verse 8. Open shame belongs to us, O Lord, to our kings and our princes and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. They were shamed. They were ashamed of themselves for their behavior. They used to be somebody. Their land was a glorious land. They were a great people, but now they're outcasts. They're wanderers, refugees. They were scattered everywhere in a shame. Their treacherous sins had sent them away and their faces were covered with shame. Their kings, princes, and fathers were shamed because they had sinned against the Lord. And confession, Daniel's confession, it just keeps coming out throughout this whole passage that we're looking at, throughout this whole prayer. Look down at verse 10. Nor have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his teachings which he set before us through his servants, the prophets. See, they wouldn't listen to the prophets. And Daniel sums it all up in verse 11. Indeed, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, not obeying your voice. So the curse has been poured out on us along with the oath which is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, for we have sinned against him. All Israel has transgressed, he says. And I want you to note something else with me in verse 11. One of the truest elements of confession is that when God chastens us for sin, we accept the responsibility for the chastening. We don't blame God. People often do that. They often want to blame God. They want to pass the buck. Isn't that what Adam did? Right? Lord, this woman you gave me, it's her fault. And we've been passing the buck ever since. But one of the truest elements of confession is that therefore the curse is poured out upon us because we have sinned. It's our fault, and we have to admit it. Look at verse 12. Thus he has confirmed his words, which he had spoken against us and against our rulers who ruled us to bring on us great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what has been done in Jerusalem. Nothing like this had ever happened before or ever since. A whole nation led into captivity. But it happened just as God said it would. He wrote it in his book. And this way and now it was happening just as he said it would. They couldn't blame God. Look at verse 13. As it is written in the law of Moses... All this calamity has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our iniquity and giving attention to your truth. And so when we sin and things go bad in our lives, we have to accept the responsibility. For the children of Israel, even when the pain of their suffering came, they didn't confess their sin. Look at verses 14 and 15. Therefore the Lord has kept the calamity in store and brought it on us. 
For the Lord our God is righteous with respect to all his deeds which he has done, but we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who have brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, as it is this day, we have sinned, we have been wicked. And so we see more elements today of true intercessory prayer. It's generated by the Word of God. It's grounded in the will of God. It's characterized by fervency. It's realized in self-denial. It's identified with God's people, and it's strengthened in our confession. We'll pick up here next time and hopefully learn some more things in Daniel's prayer that can challenge us and help us in our own prayer lives. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this prayer, this man, the things we're learning, and we look to you. Father, would you help us to learn from a passage like this? Would you teach us Impress upon our hearts. We're all at different places in life, different places in our relationship with you. But help us to learn the principles we need to learn here, Father. Thank you that your word tells us if we conceal our transgressions, we will not prosper. But if we confess them and forsake them, we will receive mercy. Father, we praise you that you are a God whose mercies are new every morning and time and again in your word. When your people confess their sins and then turn from them, you swoop in and you meet them with great compassion and mercies, tenderness. Thank you, O oh God, that you are a forgiving God, that your anger does not last forever. Would you bless this message to our hearts for your glory? And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.